that's actually kind of a perfect analogy for recovery. So the other day I was outside with Lucy the Beagle and I was letting her out before I was going to feed her her second breakfast, which is her second meal of the day. We call it that because when we adopted her, we fed her one meal a day and it was always when we were eating breakfast. So she associates the word breakfast with food, dog food. So now that she eats twice a day, she has breakfast and second breakfast because yay Tolkien. Anyway, I was sitting out on the steps watching her in the yard just to make sure that she didn't get into anything she didn't need to be. And I noticed there was a huge wasp buzzing around close to her, not quite right by her, but it was like getting closer to her. First of all, I'm terrified of anything that stings or buzzes or wasps, yellow jackets, bees, the ones that don't sting and the ones that do sting, they both terrify me as much as I would love to love them because I know they help the ecosystem. They terrify me. Insects that sting are some of the most terrifying things in the world. And as I was sitting on the steps, I noticed that it kept getting closer to Lucy and kept getting closer to Lucy. And I was terrified, one, for myself, just terrified to watch it, but two, even more terrified that it was going to sting her because as terrified as I am for myself, it is even more heartbreaking for me to imagine something like that hurting her. So I was sitting there on the stairs and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to get down in the yard and bite this jerk. I'm gonna have to go down there. And I didn't have a fly swatter or anything. I just had my hand. I didn't even have tennis shoes on, but I'm gonna have to run out in the yard, get down there in a fist fight with this freaking wasp that I'm terrified of so it doesn't hurt someone who I love even more. And then it hit me. That's actually kind of a perfect analogy for recovery. Because even when it's the very last thing that you want to do, you have to fight the jerk that is your eating disorder despite being completely terrified, despite being paralyzed in fear, in order to keep your eating disorder from stinging and hurting the souls and the beings that you love dearly. And while I do think it's true that for recovery to be true and long-lasting and possibly even full, you do have to want it for yourself. You do have to want recovery for yourself. However, if you're not quite to that point, doing recovery actions for the people that you love to keep them from feeling pain, to work toward the life that you deserve to live with them together and that they deserve to live with you, sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that's enough. It can be really powerful, even if you don't quite want it for yourself yet, to use the love that you have for the people and the beings that you care about to propel you forward into taking action in recovery because you know that you love them and you know that you don't want to hurt them. And even if it's not you hurting them, you don't want to give the eating disorder a little in to then hurt them. I just wanted to share that analogy because it hit home to me. It was a very real world example that came to me in real time. And as I so often do, I thought, hmm, if this is something that was helpful to me at all, it might be helpful to someone else. So remember, wanting recovery for yourself is necessary at some point. However, if you're not to that point, there is no shame and there is even strength to be found in still taking the actions despite the fear, keeping in mind the people that you love and knowing that ultimately you're taking actions so that this eating disorder can no longer hurt them in the ways that it has and in the ways that it's hurt you and in the ways that it has prevented you from being able to live your life and in the ways that it has prevented them from being able to live life with you. Sometimes you gotta run toward the wasp.